Hey, I wanna take a second and say welcome to Flatirons. Whether you're someplace on the planet watching online, you're in the Denver area or whatever that is, you're a part of us and we're glad that you chose to spend this time together with us. We are actually in a series based on like, what are the most important truths, values, uh, we'll call them pillars of our faith that we must have individually in our lives so that we can stand strong, but also as a church, how we're gonna continue to follow after Jesus well. So this is a great time. Uh, if you're in the Denver area, we wanna invite you to, to visit one of our, our five campuses. You can find all of that on our website. If you wanna know more uh, about Flatirons and, and what other opportunities there are for you, text NEXT to 80857 and we'll get back with you right away. Again, so glad you're a part of us today. I think that uh, being led by Christ, being led by the Spirit is a, a journey. It doesn't happen in one day. It's inside change that happens from the moment Christ uh, is your Lord and Savior, and then it happens all the way to the end of your, end of your life. And uh, a, a lot of times life, you know this, doesn't look like or feel like or turn out the way we thought it was going to. And then we look at Jesus and go like, hey, I thought I could trust you. I thought you were gonna lead me in you know, green pastor, whatever that is. I was here a couple of years ago with Dr. Mark Moore and uh, we were standing down, down here behind me. There's a, a really famous arch down there. And this is where the generals who'd gone and conquered lands all over the world, they would, they would bring their POWs, they would bring their, uh, their, their slaves. Uh, they, they brought people back. They would march them through the middle of that arch, right? And then if you took a right-hand turn, uh, you went to the Colosseum and then you were just baked, you were just slaughtered, right? But if you took a left-hand term, you'd go up here to the to the form and you were sold as slaves. And, and you have to think that in that procession, there were people who were Christians, right? Um, that, that followed Jesus. And if they're like me, things are going through their heads like we go through yours. Jesus, this is not how I thought it was gonna go. This is not where I thought you were gonna lead me. And so Paul, Paul understands this because Paul was executed just a, a mile or two from here after living in a, a pit in the in the basement, of, like the basement of the basement chained uh, to, to a wall. And so he writes things like this. He says like, I'm crucified with Christ. Like I've already died, right? It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. He says this, like for me to live, to draw breath, that's Christ. And for me to die, that that's gain, all right? So death had, that, no fear, no hold on on the followers of Jesus back in, in that day. Uh, he, Mark uh, gave me this this um, this verse out of Second Corinthians. He says this. So there's people in line to either be executed or sold into slavery. This is who he's writing to. Okay, thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us in the triumphal procession. So that he's not leading them to their deaths and to defeat. Christ is leading us in a triumphal procession, and through us spreads the, listen this, the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing to one a fragrance from death to death to the other a fragrance from life to life. So what Paul is saying is this process of spiritual formation that's gonna take the rest of your life, starts on the inside and then works its way out. So much so that Paul says, as you live your life, whether you're marching to your death or whether you're, you're, you're going to work or you're, you're know, pursuing your marriage, you're gonna smell like Christ. I mean, the, the aroma, like the fragrance of Christ is gonna come off of you. And again, that doesn't happen one day or I prayed a prayer on a Tuesday. That is a, that's a journey, right? Paul went on that journey. Jesus leads us on that journey. Every Christian that's come before you is on that journey. And every Christian behind us has to follow that same journey. It doesn't always look like we thought it was, but it'll always lead us to a good place. The more we are led by the Spirit, the more we'll be like Christ, and that's the goal. All right. Hey, let's go. Um, hey, before we get into this, I wanna add uh, my gratitude to the men and women uh, of our, our military. I, I would say this is that, I, I hold, you all hold a special place in my heart. The Army saved my dad's life. Um, my dad grew up highly dysfunctional and he actually found purpose and then he met my mom and now I'm here. So I'm very grateful uh, to, the, to, to, to military men and women. Last night I, I was able to have prayer with a man right down here and uh, I asked him like, where he served and he said Vietnam and he has tears going down. And he said, I never thought a church would even remember us. And so just so you know, the value that's not up here is I'm committed to us being the most unwoke church in America. And so we're gonna keep on doing politically incorrect stuff. So, <clears throat> yeah. 
Uh, again, I also want to say this is that uh, last week, Jesse, at the last minute, he stepped in for me and did an amazing job. We had over 500 people baptized last weekend. Um, I, I, I mentioned it two weeks ago. Uh, I went back to Tennessee to be with my sister and my, my brother-in-law, Billy. He passed away. Um, and I'm going back this week for his celebration of life. But I, I just want to, Jesse's somewhere. He's listening on one of our campuses. Will you just give it up? He's a great young teacher. I love him so much. And then this didn't have anything to do anything, but while I was gone, it was Halloween. Oh, can you say that in church? Yes. Uh, so anyway, when I got back, somebody sent me this, really cracked me up. Uh, they say imitation is the greatest form of flattery. And so Chris Langston is our student pastor up at Longmont campus. And his, his daughter, Zoe, this, this is her Halloween costume. And it, <laughs> like, boom, nailed it. You know, it's like... Uh, I, don't know, I, I, I see a little resemblance there. She even has a bald wig on. It's so, so great. Thank you, Zoe, wherever you are out there. But give it up for her. She's like three. I don't know. Eight, 10, 12. I don't know. I didn't have anything to do with anything. I just, uh, but anyway, it's funny. Anyway, what I do want to do is I want to continue working our way through our values that drive everything we do as a church called Flatirons. If you're new around here, you'll kind of figure out what kind of church you landed in. And hopefully that same, those same values drive everything that we do as individuals who say, I follow, I follow Jesus, okay? Um, and you're gonna need a Bible today, like you do every day, but I'm, nobody's moving. Anyway, so, because you all brought them, there's free Bibles in the back of all of our campuses. Just tell some kid to go get you one right now, all right? And, uh, but values, by definition, are the things that you hold to be, like, valuable, like, most important. Like, many things in your life are important, just not everything is equally important, and it gets a little confusing, and the most important values are what drive every part of your life. And I mean every part. Your values drive how you do marriage, right? Because of what's important to you. Uh, how you do finances, how you express your sexuality. It, it's tied to your values. How you live out all the parts of your life will reveal what you consider to be most important. If I wanna know what's most important to you, I just follow you around for a week. Well, she must really be into that because she spends a lot of time and money on it, right? So values are the foundational pillars upon which you build your life. And so every once in a while, um, personally, but also as a church, it's good to, to go back and call a time out and review those values and then see if, if over time, like unintentionally, but just the pressures of culture and life or the busyness of life, is it possible that we have drifted off of those values um, and, and look at what, what might need to change in our life to get back to what we at one time said, that's really important, I don't wanna lose that. Again, it's true as individuals, right? But it's also true as a church. So a quick review, and as I, I'm gonna go through the first two values real quick. Let me, let me answer a question that's floating out there. We, we didn't change our values. <laughs> so when did we change our values? We didn't, all right? We're just giving them some different, hopefully more memorable titles. Like here's the first one we started with, uh, know God through his word. It's the same value that if you looked on the website a month ago, we referred to as biblical authority. It's the same thing, all right? We believe that the Bible, right, is God's word. He gave it to us. And in his word, it is actually possible to come to know who God is and what his will is for for our lives. We're gonna, we're gonna look at that today, all right? If, if we'll not just read it, you know, and, and then memorize it and even say I believe part of it, but, but go beyond that, also we read something and go, I need to adjust my life to that. I have to submit myself to what God says is true. Uh, the way that God best reveals his nature and his character is through the life of his son Jesus, who is cover to cover, this, this book is about Jesus. Jesus said that if you take his words and then build your life, all the parts of your life, on what he says is true, your life will stand when, not if, but when the storms of life hit. And we've all been hit by storms. And some of us fell down and some of us stood standing. What's the difference? Jesus says, build your life on me. Second value, value number two is led by the Spirit. We used to, we, we've called this relational intimacy. We believe that when a person puts their faith and trust in Jesus, who he is and what he has done, what he promises to do in our life, namely, we put our faith in his, his life, his death, his burial, his resurrection. When we put our trust in Jesus, a person is saved by grace. That means it's a free gift, all right? And God gives it to you, again, based on faith in what Jesus has done for you, not something that you might need to do from now on to earn or merit forgiveness or eternal life. It's a gift, all right? So that's what we've covered for the last month in here, which brings us to value number three, led by the Spirit, which we have in the past and we will always call spiritual formation. Spiritual formation, let me kind of get us all on the same page, all right? Um, let me explain. We, we are all to some degree, and you, you've heard this phrase before, we are products of our environment, right? We're, we're products of our culture, meaning this is that we are all raised somewhere. And when you're raised in the middle of something, that's all you know. And then it forms it forms your life. Culture, by definition, when I say culture, this is what I mean. What you do without even thinking. 
Like when you got in a car today, most of us drove on the right-hand side of the road. We didn't really think about it. Or, or you're not here because you're dead. All right, so, all right, so it's, it's, I, I, just, I don't even think about that. It's what I do. It's how I was raised. Now, here's the point. When you step outside of your culture or another culture bumps into you, that's when stuff gets interesting. Like I, I was in Egypt last month and I had to keep asking our, our, our guide, like what's happening right now? Like what am I supposed to do? Like, like, like how do they do that here? Because they eat different in Egypt. They drive different in Egypt. Wow, it's nuts, all right, all right? Uh, men and women interact differently in Egypt, and what is culturally normal here in the United States would be super offensive in Egypt. Like, you could get killed for that, all right? The, the things that we find most scary or disorienting is when something happens and it conflicts with our, well, I don't know, this is how I've always thought about it. This is how I've always done it. And when, when something different comes our way, here's what we do. We either run away from it and say, that's just wrong, we reject it. Or here's what I hope happens this weekend, all right? That maybe we lean into that and consider it and see if it could actually be better than what we've always held on to as, well, that's just the way I do it. And that process of changing or reforming your normal is called formation. And when it comes to like your ideas, your norms, the, the way you've always thought about something, what you've always considered something to be true and possible, when your values begin to change, and eventually the behaviors that are driven by those reformed values, that process is called spiritual Formation. You're being formed, reformed, right? And it's led and it's caused by the Spirit of Christ living in you. It happens from the inside out. It's the number one thing Jesus taught about. It wasn't heaven or hell or should you do that or should you do that? No, number one thing. Jesus, and prove me wrong if you don't believe this, read the Gospels this afternoon, right? Jesus opened almost every teaching with some version of this challenge. Before he, he taught anything, he'd say this, repent, why? The kingdom of God's here. Now look at that word repent, because I, I, I was raised in church, I went to camp and all that stuff, and it was always like, you need to repent, all right? And I've always been taught repent means you ought to be very sorry for what you've done. You should repent for the way that you've lived your life in the past, and you gotta promise to do better. And I'm like, I, I, I repent, I repent, right? And, and, it, and it, listen, it may include some level of being sorry for your past, but that's not what repentance means. As a matter of fact, you're going, I'm really sorry for my past and I'm gonna try to do better. That actually flies in the face of grace when you think about it. See, when Jesus taught repent, the kingdom of God is here, here's what he meant, all right? He said this, in, in light of what I'm about to teach you and, and what I'm about to show you, what I'm, what I'm about to make available to you, in light of what I'm making possible for any person who puts their trust in me, value number two, in light of all that, repent, what does that mean? You need to rethink how you think about everything. Everything you thought was normal. You might wanna rethink it because it is now possible to live your life in a way that before me uh, was impossible by, by effort or willpower or you'd already have lived that. But when you put your faith in me, Jesus, when you trust Jesus, I put my spirit in you and now everything's gonna be different. Here's why. Because you're different from the inside out. It's not behavior modification. Something changed in me. Now, listen, think about this. See, what, whatever we hold on to up to this point in our life, whatever we, we believe this is true, there, there's a reason we believe it. We didn't just think it up one day in a vacuum on Tuesday. Well, here's what I think about that, right? Like, when, I'll give you an example. When I say marriage, everybody thinks something, right? And the reason you think whatever you're thinking is due to the culture you grew up in. Uh, I say marriage, and you, some of you go to your parents' marriage and go, no, thank you. Or some of you go to your first or your second marriage, whatever, they go, no, no, not, not doing that again, right? Um, you look around and you see how people are living out their marriages and, 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 and then it kind of forms your idea and definition of marriage. And any, anything, I th if I say family, you think something. What does it take to be successful? You think something. When I say sex, when I say money, when I say friendship, when I say what does it mean to be significant, you think something and there's a reason that you have landed there. It makes sense. It's the same way, let's push into this. When I say something like, God, you think something, right? When I say Jesus, when I say church, when I say faith, when I say forgiveness, you think something, and here's why. Your life and experiences up to this point, and this point I'm talking about, the chair you're sitting in right now, everything up to this point has formed what you are holding on to as normal and true. Does that make sense? Not at me, all right. All right. So, so Jesus comes along and says, well, I, I'm making some new things possible for you, and by making it possible for you to live every part of the life that 
whatever comes to mind, right? To, to live all that part of life with God by, by taking your kingdom, and that's what you did all week long, that's your kingdom, and putting it inside of the kingdom of God, you can not only just know God and trust Jesus, but if you're willing to, to repent, and it's up to you, all right? What do I mean? You gotta rethink what you've always held on to as normal. Here's where I wanna walk away with today, right? You can live a with God kind of life now. In, in other words, eternal life starts the moment that you trust Jesus, and it is a different kind of life. This is how Jesus describes the life that he says is possible for you, the life that he came to, to provide for you. This is in John, this is Jesus talking. He says, the thief, calling about evil, Satan, all right? The thief comes only, so this is the agenda of the enemy, all right? Only to steal from you, kill you, and destroy everything that you love. Then Jesus says, I have come that they, and they would be us, may have life and have it, what's the word? Abundantly, not just keep you alive. I mean, to live an abundant kind of life. So through Jesus, we can know God, and by trusting Jesus, we can be saved and forgiven. And then once we are saved, Jesus promised to put his own presence, his spirit in us to begin the process of spiritual formation so that our values and our thoughts and our beliefs about what is true begin to more and more align with what Jesus says is right and true. And it's led by the spirit. And then Jesus leads us to experiencing what he says is an abundant life. You can have life to the full. I got a question now. Think about this. Would, would you describe your current life with Jesus as abundant? One, one dude is, he's good. Baby. Are you want to preach? Come on, all right. Um, like, would you look, like my life with Jesus is full. It's, it's overflowing. And I, I, there's all kinds of answers in this room, right? And the answer, why? Or why not? Uh, let me illustrate this. In sports, there's a term called playing not, not to lose, like the Rockies. Anyway, so anyway, so... Um, Come on, I'm still hopeful. Right, but, well, it means this. It's like all they have is defense. There's just no real effort, no intentionality, no hope of actually winning the game. They're just trying not to lose as bad. I think, this is, my, this is me, all right? I think the reason that so many of us Christians aren't experiencing abundant life is because we've reduced trusting Jesus down to playing not to lose. We, we put our faith in Jesus sometime, right? And then we, we say, okay, I prayed a prayer, whatever this, and I feel less guilt and shame about my past, and then I've cut back on some, some sins, all right? But most of us, when we think about our life with Jesus, we don't think about living a joyful life or an abundant life, or, or like Jesse you know, read from Romans 8 last week, very few of us looked in the mirror uh, this week and looked at that person and went, you're more than a conqueror. I, I didn't. I went, you did it again. See, here's where most of us, this is what's what going through our, our head all, all week long, right? Life is hard, life is unfair, life sucks, but hold on, after we die, it gets better. Right, this, Jesus never taught that. See, when, he's, when Jesus said he came that we might have and experience abundant life, he meant eternal life, but he also meant this. Look at this, this is, take a picture of this, all right? Eternal life doesn't start after your funeral. Eternal life begins the moment that you trust Jesus from now on. So why aren't we experiencing abundant life? That's what I wanna to unpack today, right? I, I want us to turn to a passage in the book of Romans, Romans chapter seven, get it on your phone or go, go get a Bible, right? And, um, and, and I'm gonna start reading it, and even if you don't have a Bible, you've heard this, and just look around the room as I'm reading this, all right? Because you're gonna see a whole bunch of heads start nodding because it will describe what most of us feel like when it comes to following Jesus all weeks. Uh, Romans 7, all right? And, and this might sound a little confusing because it's like a kind of a, a word play, all right? But you'll get it, all right? This is Paul describing what his own Christian life has felt like at times and what many of us experience when we say, I, I follow Jesus. He says this. He says, I, I don't understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that, that it is good. So, so now... It's no longer I who do it, but sin that lives in me. For I, here's what I know. I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is in my, my, my flesh. This is so, so familiar. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. Can I get an amen? Yeah. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Can anybody relate to that? Because that's, that's right. See, what I want to do, I don't do. And what I don't want to do, I, I keep on doing that. And everybody nods their heads, right? Yeah, yeah, that's, that's my Christian life. I keep on saying, I've said like three times, that's the last time, all right? And from now on, I'm gonna do better. And here's the thing, in the moment, we mean it. And it lasts about five minutes. 
And then I end up doing the very thing that five minutes ago I swore I'd never do. And, and, yeah, and yeah, we can all relate to that. And then somebody will probably go, that, yeah, but when we get to heaven, the tug of war game will all be over. Listen, I'm, I'm gonna bust some of your Christian bubbles today. It's my spiritual gift, all right? You're welcome. Ready? I don't think it means that. Or how about this, all right? I think it means more than that. Because after Paul gives the description of how life with Jesus feels sometimes, he asks and then he answers his own question. Look at this, all right? He says, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? So that's the question, and he answers it. Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Jesus is gonna take care of me. And he's not referring to a day in the future when we're somewhere else with Jesus, a Disney castle in the sky. He's not saying that. He's not saying, hang on, one day you'll be dead and your flesh won't be a problem anymore and then you'll be delivered. That's not what he is teaching here, right? He is saying that Jesus has already provided a way of being delivered from that tug of war between following Jesus and then giving into sin over and over. It starts with an event. You gotta put your faith in Jesus. Gotta trust Jesus. I'm gonna preach that every weekend here, right? You gotta trust Jesus. And then it is a continual, ongoing, progressive journey of being led by the Spirit, being conformed by the Spirit. See, if Jesus' number one teaching is that it is possible for ordinary people like us to live a with God kind of life that's as real as the one Adam and Eve experienced in the garden, wouldn't that be, wouldn't that be awesome just walking with, walking with God? It's also described in the final two chapters, the first two chapters of the Bible and the last two chapters of the Bible, very, very similar because God makes his dwelling with us. When Jesus taught that he had made that possibility possible for you through what he did for you, what you claimed when you said, I'm putting my faith in Jesus, that he meant from, from that point on. Like now, you're living in the kingdom of God now, and the kingdom of God is living in you because at that moment, the Holy Spirit of Christ is living in you. Jesus just isn't in a book. He's not even just with you. He's in you, and he's doing something in us, if we'll let him. Now, now, now hang on, I, I'm, I really am I'm going somewhere with this. Most of us, and I, I keep saying most of us, I'm just talking about my own story, all right? Most of us put our trust in Jesus. Maybe even last week, you know, 500, you got baptized and you thought, whew, I made it. I did it, right? Which on one level, you did. I'm not taking away from that. But while putting your faith in Jesus is a very, very important foundational part that must be in place or nothing else you try to put in place will stand, please hear this, all right? Putting your faith in Jesus is a starting line it's not the finish line. It's the beginning of something. It's the end of something. It's the beginning. I'll give you an example. Most of us, if we were asked tomorrow at school or work or, or at a ballgame or whatever, if we were asked that question, so are, are, are you a Christian? Most of us go, yeah. But then they, what if they followed it with another question? Well, what makes you a Christian? And we would say, like, um, well, there was this day in my life, I put my faith, my trust in Jesus and what he did for me. Here's the third question that we start getting a little nervous about. What difference did that make? What difference did putting your faith in Jesus make in your life? Other than the assurance that after you die, you go to heaven instead of hell, all right? But, but what else? And we're like, Ugh. well, I, I, I do this, I used to do this stuff, really bad stuff, and I don't do that as much. And I try to do good things more. And then they say, well, how's that working for you? And you know what you do? You go over to Romans 7. Well, I want, what I want to do, I don't do. And what I don't want to do, I keep on doing. Right? So when we look at this third value led by the Spirit, I want to throw an idea at you. It's, it's, it's kind of fresh to me in the last year. Uh, I, I, it's so good, I, I didn't think it up. One of my favorite authors and teachers, Dallas Willard, he gave me this, and it's causing me to re- repent, rethink how I think about faith in Jesus. Now, I promise me, I'm, I, I'm not a heretic any more than you already thought I was, okay? Just go with me on this, all right? Faith in Jesus, trust in Jesus is foundational. It's the highest value and the most important one. But once a person has put their faith in Jesus, it must lead to something more. And here's what I, I wanna unpack with you. Faith in Jesus is the foundational value upon something new and possible can be built, which is the faith of Jesus. Now, you should write that down because that's Dallas Willard. That's good, right? Faith in Jesus means this. I believe. 
I believe Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. He's my Lord and Savior, all right? What he did on the cross counts for me. I am saved by his grace when I put my faith in Jesus. His death, his burial, his resurrection counts for me. That's faith in Jesus. The faith of Jesus is now that I have trusted Jesus, Jesus is like from now on goal for my life. Again, we looked at it last week in Romans 8, is to use all things to do something in your life. Good, right? And for you, here it is, to be conformed to the image of his son. Everybody's going, I just wish I knew what God's will is for my life. Well, write this down. Here it is, all right? That more and more, I don't, I, maybe you're a doctor or a lawyer or a teacher. Or a, uh, I don't know. I, I don't know about that. That's not his biggest will for your life. It's that more and more your life is conformed more and more into the same kind of life as the life of Jesus because more and more you're becoming more like the same kind of person that Jesus is. I'm not saying you're gonna walk on water or turn water into wine. How cool would that be? Uh, right, but... It means this, over time, progressively, not all at once, my faith in Jesus causes me to live out the faith of Jesus, to start believing what he believed, to see things the way that he sees things, to respond to any circumstance in the same way that he would respond because I have the same lens, I have the same faith, I have the same trust, I have the same perspective as Jesus. Like when Jesus walked into a room and found himself in any circumstance, he, he, he viewed it and he responded in, from a certain perspective that kind of, kind of kept everything in place. When I walk into a room full of chaos, you know what happens? I just join the chaos, right? I just like, well, let's go, let's fight, all right, right, right. Jesus was different, he just saw it different. So here's what's going on, and here, here's what I know to be true about God. That's what he, that, that, that's what he saw everything through. The faith of Jesus is, I know God and there's something more going on here. And then he responded accordingly. I want to I be more like that. I, I'll show you a difference. Uh, if you have a Bible, we're gonna, we're gonna turn to Matthew chapter eight, okay? It's a very famous story, Matthew chapter eight. Um, I'll, I'll set it up. Jesus is on this one side of, there's this big lake in the middle of Israel. It's called the Sea of Galilee, it's still there. And he decides, hey, let's go to the other side. I was there a couple years ago. It's not a big lake, all right? It's about eight miles across at its, its widest point. But due to its geography, it's, it's the lowest altitude freshwater lake in the world. So there are all these mountains coming down to it. And because of its geography, uh, these wind storms come down from the mountains and they hit that lake with like hurricane force winds. Now, if you, later this afternoon, if you read the paragraphs above this story, Jesus has just done some stuff and then he looks at his disciples and says, I want you to follow me. I'm, I'm going, I want you to follow me. And then here's what happens next. Look at this. And when he got into the boat, the disciples followed him. So we have a win there, right there, right? And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea so that the boat was being swamped by the waves, but Jesus was asleep. And they went and they woke him up saying, save us, Lord, we are dying, all right? We're perishing. And he said to them, why are you afraid? Oh, you of little faith. Then he rose and he rebuked the winds in the sea. In another, verse, another uh, book it says, he looked at it and said, peace, be still. And there was a great calm. And the men, the disciples marveled saying, what kind of man, what sort of man is this that even winds and sea obey him? Now follow me, okay? Jesus has just said on the beach, right? Hey, I, I, want, you to, I want you to follow me. I'm gonna teach you something new. You're gonna have to rethink faith. It's very, very different. So here we go. So they get into a boat and a big storm hits and they think that the waves are about to sink the boat. The disciples are freaking out. Why? Because when they looked at the storm, their cultural context, their experience said, storms kill people. That was, that was their, their perspective. That was all they knew what was possible, storms sink boats. A couple of those guys that are disciples, in their former life, like before they met Jesus, they were fishermen on this lake. They had friends at the bottom of this lake because storms just like this, this is what's gonna happen. And where's Jesus? He's taking a nap, right? He's, and they go wake him up. Hey, Lord, save us, we're gonna die. So they give him credit. They knew if anybody could save them, it would be Jesus, so Jesus woke up and he saw the storm, but he saw the storm through a different lens. Uh, the, the faith that he knew about what God is like, value one. And then from that faith, he spoke to the storm and it stopped. Here's the difference. The disciples saw the storm and had faith in Jesus, which is good. 
That's good. If anybody's gonna get us out of this, it's gonna be Jesus, right? Jesus saw the exact same storm and because of his faith, he faced the storm and he overcame it. And he's gonna say, that's better. The disciples' faith in Jesus told them who they could trust, but the faith of Jesus allowed Jesus to not just survive a storm, but calm the storm. And then he turns to the disciples and, and says, not just, you don't, have, you don't have enough faith. He wasn't really like rebuking them. He, he says, you don't have the right kind of faith yet. In other words, the faith that got you in this boat, it has to grow to something more. It, 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 your, your faith in me must grow into the same kind of faith that I have. See, see, faith in Jesus leads to the faith of Jesus. And when you have the faith of Jesus, you live your life differently. Not because you try, that's Romans 7. I'm trying to do better, right? right. No, you live your life differently because you are different. You're being led by the Spirit. Now, I'm gonna give you one more passage. We're gonna get out of here, right? And, and I'm gonna go old school here. My grandpa will be so happy. We're gonna go King James Version. Can I get an amen, all right? So, uh, and the reason is because uh, there, there's a lot of translations from the Bible, and they're all very, very close, and some words are off a little bit, right? Um, but this one translates more literally from the original language that this portion of the Bible was written in. Very famous passage, but with a slight change in this one word, all right? It says this, this is Paul talking. He says this, I am crucified with Christ, Nevertheless, I live, not, yet not I, but Christ liveth in, in me. So in that, that part right there, he's talking about I have faith in Christ. I'm crucified with Christ. I am putting my trust in what Jesus did for me on the cross. Then he says this, but I'm not dead. I'm, I'm still alive. But I'm living my physical life differently from that point on. And then Paul goes into value number three. Christ is living in me, the spirit of Christ is in me, and he's conforming me, and here's what my physical life looks like after I put my faith in Christ. And, and you could just broaden this out. What do you mean your physical life? Um, what am I gonna do with my body since I put my faith in Christ? What am I gonna do with her body or his body, right? How I'm gonna lead my marriage? How I'm gonna, how I'm gonna go with, through conflict? How I'm gonna how I'm raise my children? How I'm gonna spend my money, not spend my money? All the parts of my life, my flesh, that I live all week long, all right? Here's what it looks like, and here's how I live it. I live it, the life I, I live now in the flesh, that's why I, I live by the faith, what's the word? Of the Son of God. So the first part's in. Now I'm living my life by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for, for me. You following me? See, let me sum this up, and then we'll, we'll land this, all right? Once a person has put their faith in Jesus, the Spirit of Jesus now lives in that person. Right, So that they now live their life with the faith of Jesus, progressively being conformed to the image of Jesus and living and approaching and responding to every circumstance, good or bad, in the same kind of way with the same kind of faith that Jesus would walk into it. Does that make sense? Last example, we'll get out of here. So next weekend, I won't be here. On Saturday, I'm gonna be in Tennessee. I'm gonna be speaking at my brother-in-law's celebration of life service. Um, Billy loved Jesus. He had faith in Jesus. He, he's fine. One of his goals, he had a, a, like a bucket list uh, before he died, and one of them was to play drums here. And uh, two, two years ago, that's, that's my brother-in-law. Um, and anyway, uh, and he's really good, too. So I'm, I, I'm gonna speak of this service on Saturday. Let me just tell you this, all right? My main purpose is to encourage my sister and her family and her friends and his daughters, how to approach the death and loss of the most important person in their life. And they're gonna only make it if they have the faith of Jesus. They already have faith in Jesus, they need the faith of Jesus, because this is a valley, right? What do you mean the faith of Jesus? Well, Jesus wept at the death of his friend Lazarus, so I'm not gonna tell him not to cry. I mean, it's a loss, it's okay to be sad, right? But Jesus also, because of his faith, he knew, that, he knew that death has no sting. No power for those who have faith in Jesus. Jesus knows, and those of us who have the faith of Jesus, we already know that, the, that, that, that death has been swallowed up in victory and that Jesus defeats death. So here's what I'm gonna preach at Billy's memorial service next Saturday. And it's made possible because we have faith in Jesus, but also we have to walk into whatever it is with the faith of Jesus. And this is what it looks like whenever you walk through the hardest times of your life. Um, I'm going to try to make it through this. So we, we do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about those who have died, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. We're going to grieve, 
but we're gonna grieve differently, right? For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, faith in Jesus, even so, through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For we declare to you by the word from the Lord that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ, Billy will be there, will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. The faith of Jesus. Death, where's your sting? This isn't the end. This is just a, this moment. So I'm gonna ask you this and I'm done, all right? right? No, I'm not gonna ask, do you have faith in Jesus? But if you do have faith in Jesus, then Jesus lives in you. So here's what I want you to think about right now. What are you carrying? What problem are you thinking about this whole service? Like, what burden is so painful? Like, it's, you have overwhelmed. What, what storm's hitting your boat right now? Everybody's got one. But what would it look like because of your faith in Jesus? So you have, how about this? Because of your faith in Jesus, you can call out to the Lord right now, Lord, save me or I'm not gonna make it. That's okay. Do that a lot. But with Jesus like in the boat with you, I don't know what that storm is for you, but you can look at that storm and you can see that storm with the faith of Jesus and you can speak to it. You can tell it what it can do and cannot take from you. I'm not saying the cancer's going away. I'm not saying the divorce isn't gonna happen. I'm not saying your kid's coming back. I'm just saying, hey, storm, this is what you're allowed to do in my life and what you're not allowed to do in my life. Is it possible if you spoke to the storm with the faith of Jesus that all that fear could be replaced by, with this? Peace, be still. Doesn't that sound nice? I'll be honest with you, most of us aren't there the day we got baptized. And that's all right. Faith in Jesus, that, that's, that's, that's what you needed in that moment. Being saved is an event based on faith in an event in history. Being led by the Spirit, being spiritually like reformed is a process, it's a journey. And you think about this, Jesus didn't throw the disciple, disciples overboard because they failed some faith test. Well, I'll find other disciples. No, he just stayed in the boat with them and they just kept on going. So don't beat yourself up. Just keep on rowing. Just keep on going. See, when you put your faith in Jesus, the spirit of Jesus comes and lives inside of you. That doesn't mean that being led by the spirit just happened one day. I promise you, being led by the spirit will never happen on accident. Here, let's speak for myself. I got a lot to learn about hearing God and I have a lot to unlearn about listening to my own heart. It's, it's no different than anything important in your life. Like God doesn't zap you as you come up out of that water and you're changed. Just like I, I'm, I'm gonna get in shape this year and then God zapped me and no. Like get, get your butt off the of couch and put down the Doritos. I mean, right? It's, it, it, you have to make some choices. Do I even want that? It only happens when a person intentionally pursues a strategic plan. You can pray about it, you can wish it, you can want it. It doesn't change anything. It, it takes a plan. It takes a strategy. Well, when it comes to discipleship or spiritual formation, Dallas Willard, I'm gonna quote him a lot, right? He, he uses this phrase. He calls it spiritual apprenticeship. And some of us are in trades that we were apprentices or in military, you were apprentice, right? It goes like this. I learn from the master and then I do it with the master and then I, I do it just like the master. And that's where we're gonna pick up next week. How do I move from faith in Jesus to, to learn how to live my life with the faith of Jesus. Let's keep going, all right? All our campuses, let's stand up. I'm gonna pray, say amen, and then you have to leave. <laughs> Yellowstone's in eight hours. That's all I'm saying. Uh, um, <laughs> I'm trying to channel my best John Dutton right now. Um, God, I, I come to you in this moment after all that worship about how I can trust you and there's power in the name of your son Jesus, but Lord, we're looking at life and the life that we're living right now, it's just all we know. We've been handed a life, we've been handed circumstances. It's formed us and conformed us and we're not dumb, we, it's, just, it's just what we know. And then you come along and go, there's a better way. And it sounds good, but it also sounds scary because that means I would have to let go of the familiar, even if it's broken, at least I know it. 
But if I, if I know you, God, and that you're good and you want good for me and you love me, and Jesus, if you've already demonstrated that I can trust you, then maybe I do need to rethink this part of my life and, and, and consider letting go of what I always thought my life was gonna be and maybe reach out and take hold of something better, like may, maybe like more abundant. So God, wherever you're gonna lead us this week by your spirit, help us to listen. Help us to j- drop our defensives. You know, nobody, no preacher's gonna change our life. No parent's gonna change our life. No husband or wife's gonna change our life. The only person in the universe that can change our life is your spirit in us. So we're listening to him. Lead us where you want us to go. Take good care of us on the way. We love you so much. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen? All right. Thanks for joining us at Flatirons Church Online. We're so glad you chose to be with us today. Now listen, we are always adding brand new content. So please subscribe so you can stay up to date with all of it. And remember, we're streaming services every single Sunday. Now, if you'd like to continue to help us support the ministry of Flatirons Church of reaching a lost and broken world, please hit that give button and join in with all that God's doing here at Flatirons. We'll see you next week.